want to apologize to um, everybody who we made sit around. Um, maybe it was the room that we chose that caused this delay. I don't know. How many people have sat in this room where we convened and then went away for the call of the chair for an hour and it turned into six or 12 hours and then you come back and adjourn. Then we were actually going to meet. So hey, you're up, Senator Liebling. Uh, thanks for your patience with us. We were um, having a, one of those meetings that we have and um, I, I believe we, we have a quorum uh, on both sides, so I'm happy about that. Um, and Representative Liebling, do you have a session again today at uh, some time? Uh, thanks, thanks, Senator. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we do have a hard stop at 3.30 for right. floor session, and I'm uh, sorry about that. I know this is, uh, this is challenging, but... Uh, no, I, I get it. It's totally it's fine. Um, so I think what we're going to do is forego. I know you're going to be sad, Representative Liebling, not to hear the, how, the Senate's, you know, health and licensing board article. And I know you're keenly interested in seeing what we did with the Board of Pharmacy to see where we're going to build our agreement. Um, but I think just given the time and people have driven as far as from Fergus Falls to come be with us today, I think we're going to embark on our uh, discussion about the uh, Representative Pinto math, uh, which is what we're going to title this, uh, this meeting. Um, and uh, so we're, we're going to hear from three different, um, three different presentations. And uh, on uh, NEMT and DWRS and, um, and nursing homes. And the, um, the, Ferg the fellow from Fergus, is that a nursing home thing? Yeah, you're a Fergus. Let's just take you first, because you're the, you came the longest, and, and uh, well, we're gonna do nursing homes first. Sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to trick you there. We got some false alarms going here, and everybody's so excited. You can just cut it with a knife, can't you? But, you know, we, um, and just to encourage everybody, we're uh, chatting internally about uh, same and similars. And, um, and that's actually coming along. And um, Representative Liebling, I don't know if we got yours yet, they sent you some of ours. And so we can maybe talk about that offline. Um, sure. Especially if you're on the floor, maybe I can, well, we can just talk about that. We're, and we're doing the, the tax bill now ourselves pretty soon. So uh, there might be just a little interruption while I try to figure out how to vote on some amendment or not. But, um, anyway, so I'm uh, really excited to be, <laughs> this room is just so historic. I mean, it's too bad you can't be here, Tina and Jennifer, just to savor in the moment. But, this is the human services room. This is a room that should have a little shrine. There should be a little marquee on the front of the door um, honoring uh, Senator Berglund and, and so many others, Sammy and all those folks who uh, have uh, been our predecessors. So anyway, um, I'm just trying to collect my wits here and, and be a, a good host for all of you. Um, so uh, we discussed yesterday what we're uh, gonna do today. Uh, it seems like it's productive uh, to understand uh, the math, and uh, how much money do you really need anyway, um, and, and so on. And so, um, so there's a number of people uh, who are here on behalf of the nursing facilities, uh, rate adjustment in the bill, but just in general. This isn't so much about our bill, although it kind of is, but it's about what's going on. And so, um, I, I don't know, uh, I've not organized your presentation. There's some names, Nicole Matson, Tim Zwicky, Nathan Johnson, and Terry Thurlow. So in, uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, please introduce yourselves. I'd like you to, if you can do, if you want to just do a 15 minute thing or whatever you have in mind, including heavy math, we love math. Um, and so we'll just see how that goes. I may, if you get stuck, I'll introduce somebody, but uh, who's ever first, just go ahead and welcome to the committee. And nice you can be here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Nicole Matson. I'm Vice President of Strategic Initiatives with Care Providers of Minnesota, and I'm here today with the Long-Term Care Imperative. We recently conducted a survey of our members to assess the financial condition of our sector, and importantly, what it means for access to senior care in various communities throughout the state. I also testify today as a former nursing home administrator as my colleagues will share, I can say that with 25, over 25 years of experience in the long-term care sector, what we're facing today is unlike any other crisis. The results of our survey show that the average nursing home is on track to lose over $800,000 this year, and more than one-third of assisted living and nursing homes have increased base wages by 10% or more since the start of the pandemic. 
And to note, those costs are not reflected in our payment rates due to the value-based reimbursement system's timing. The survey also showed that 40% of assisted living settings and 45% of nursing home settings have operating margins of lower than negative 10%. Approximately 40 nursing homes and 400 assisted living settings are at risk of closure if the legislature does not act this session with permanent funding that we can pass along for caregiver wages. This will impact access to care for an estimated 14,000 seniors across the state of Minnesota. I could talk more about our findings, but given the urgency that seniors are facing today, I really want to turn it over to our providers, our members, so that they can tell you about their situations. I'm going to turn it over to Tim Zwicky from Interfaith Care Center in Carleton, Minnesota. Hi, Welcome. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Um, and I can't imagine your jobs right now. Surpluses and everybody from every direction coming at you about what their crisis is. And, and, and ours is, uh, for me, being in the Healthcare for 40 years, I've never seen anything like what we're dealing with. Um, I've worked for the Benedictine Health System when, and Essentia out of Duluth for, for a number of years. And if you go back and look at the roots of the, that, those organizations, the Benedictine Health System isn't even part of Essentia because the financing for long-term care uh, has been separated from hospital stuff because they, we just don't have the margins to be able to support the kind of debt that they have. Uh, but 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 anyway, I, I started in, uh, Interfaith Care Center in uh, 2016, and I I returned home to my roots, Moose Lake. And uh, one of the reasons that I uh, took the job was because uh, the state had changed the way that financing was done for long-term care, and it got changed to what I call cost-based. And it and it and it and it truly was a. a, a, a a lifesaver to the to the industry from my perspective. Um, fast forward to now, we had COVID, as we all know, and in 2020, um, uh, when it hit us, uh, if if we look at our current situation going back to then, smile, you're on camera. <laughs> I'm sorry about smiling, but anyway, so if, 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 if we go back to then, um, uh, um, in 2020, my organization viol violated its debt covenants, which means it didn't make enough money for what Wells Fargo and the bonds that were sold by the city of Carleton required. Uh, and so I got contacted by the bank and, they, uh, the, and the bondholders about what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, it'll be okay in 2021 because what happened was we got a payroll protection loan from the federal government in 2020. And um, through accounting and that kind of thing, it, it, we were able to mask the problems that exist, that existed. But right now, um, in 2022, we're on track probably to, to lose a million dollars this year. And our staffing has gone from um, within uh, the last nine months from 173 employees to 135 employees, a 25% drop. Um, and this past pay, pay period, this one we just ended, we had 154 open shifts, and we only have 70. We're only we're only operating with a with a margin or with a or with occupancy of 69 residents. So. And, and 73 times in this, in this current pay period, employees were mandated to work a double shift because we simply don't have staffing. I paid $300 last weekend for one shift for an aide to get somebody to come in on a Saturday night to cover a shift. And it is a crisis. And the crisis is driven by the certified nursing assistants are not paid enough money Right now, we're averaging about $17 an hour. I was talking to a, um, uh, I, I went to Wells Fargo a couple of weeks ago, called and said, can I get in to talk to somebody? And it had to do with some, and, and I said, are, are, is, the, is, is, the, is the lobby open in Coke? And, and he said, yes, it, now it's open. And he talked to me, he's a friend of mine, about staffing. And, and I said, so how's your staffing? And he said, it was fine. We uh, were able to raise uh, for a teller, we're paying them $20 an hour. 
And if you look at that, we got certified nursing assistants that are breaking their backs, that are dealing with what I call organics or bodily fluids, if you want to talk about it, on a day in, day out basis, breaking their backs, and they can go to Wells Fargo and work for $20 an hour, work Monday through Friday, and maybe a Saturday morning. No shift work. And we're dealing with McDonald's and Quick Trip and all of those things, and we simply don't have the staffing. Um, and what's happening is because of not being able to pay enough to attract and retain them, as I said, we're on track to lose about a million dollars this year. Within two years, we'll be out of money. And I'm not abnormal in what other facilities look like across the state of Minnesota. And I was, I can only, and I, and I liken it to, I, I can only do thoughts and prayers for so long because I've talked to the staff about, I thought that there, I was hoping there would be help and that kind of thing. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly concerned about for our long-term care industry, but also the people that we care for, that what is going on now is a crisis now, and uh, it's going to get a whole lot worse um, in the near future. So anyway, uh, th thank you for your time. Well, thanks for being here. That this answer is horrifying. Um, so it is horrifying. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, welcome. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you <clears throat> for this opportunity. My name is Nathan Johnson. I'm a licensed nursing home administrator, 21 years. Um, I'm at Pioneer Care up in Fergus Falls, which happens to be my hometown. Um, Pioneer Care is a freestanding, not-for-profit. We began in 1928, so about 94 years ago. We operate a 105-bed uh, nursing home, 70 licensed beds of assisted living dementia care, 44 units of independent living apartments, and then we provide uh, home-based technology care on a subscription basis to about 600 subscribers in every adjacent county to Otter Tail County. I have to imagine that Pioneer Care has um, seen a lot in 94 years. We've weathered storms and we've even enjoyed a few rainbows. But I don't believe that we've made it 94 years by chance. It's required careful management, strong community support, and yes, at times, legislative intervention. And I'm here today to testify that we are carefully managing. We have strong community support, and now we need legislative intervention. Um, you just heard about the results of the statewide survey. The data is alarming to me. And in just a minute here, I promise I'll share with you the gory details and the math um, of Pioneer Care's financial outlook. But first, I want to just acknowledge that the hardships that we face exist in every area of the state, but please understand my perspective today is coming from rural, from greater Minnesota. And it has hit us hard. It's hit us hard. And I'm here to tell you, in greater Minnesota, it is a mandate that our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities will be there and can be relied upon for our community members when they need us. Um, the vast majority of the people that we care for come from Fergus Falls or within a 20-mile radius. People don't want to drive far from town to get care, uh, but it's already happening, and in some cases, up to 200 miles to find an open bed. Um, and the data shows that it's going to get worse. So I'm deeply concerned about our organization. Frankly, without the support of the Senate HHS bill, we may have no choice but to close um, restructure under bankruptcy, reduce occupancy further, sell. These are some of the hard decisions we're facing right now. Um, so I promised the gory details and the math of our situation. I'll get into it, but I just want to say this is not fun to talk about, especially in a very public forum like this. It feels vulnerable. Um, but we need to talk about these truths. Uh, at this point, it feels like it's beyond our control as providers, um, and it's the legislature that has the power to help. So, so here's what's going on in Fergus Falls at our place. We are using cash reserves to operate. We don't have a lot of reserves, but we do have some. Our cash reserves um, slightly exceed the minimum requirement of 60 days cash on hand that's required by our mortgage lender. In real numbers, that means we've got about $4 million in reserves. Um, and we must keep 
two and a half million dollars in reserves at all times to be in compliance with our loan covenants. This year we're projecting to spend about 1.8 million of our reserves. At that rate of burn by the year end, we will likely default on our, on our mortgage and we will be completely out of cash by the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024. So how did this happen? <clears throat> I think the math is pretty easy to understand actually. Um, we had a we had a workforce shortage that nobody saw coming. Uh, there, there were trends indicating prior to the pandemic, but it accelerated many fold. In our case, we've lost 25% of our workforce. We're down 25%. And that has forced us to limit admissions and reduce our occupancies. So suffice it to say, we have many empty beds across our campus that we could fill if we had the staff to safely staff them. The demand is there, but the, the workforce is not. So this reduction in occupancy means lost revenue. Um, we had a 13% reduction in revenue last year, and that has not come back this year. That's a huge amount, especially in the context of our historically low operating margins. In 2019, we had a positive operating margin of 1%. In 2020, we had an operating loss of 1.5%. Last year, an operating loss of 8%. And this year, we're projecting an operating loss of 10%. With those losses, we can't cut enough from operations to safely make it work. And we certainly don't have enough to cover our fixed costs like debt and simple maintenance uh, and upkeep. And so until we get our occupancy back up, we will be using cash reserves at an alarming rate. And again, the only way that occupancy can come back up is if we hire more healthcare professionals. And the number one issue is, is wages. And that's, that's what the, the Senate HHS bill will help us with. So just to wrap up here, I've been with Pioneer Care for 15 years. Um, I have deep roots in Fergus Falls. It's where my family and I want to be. Over the years, Pioneer Care has made significant investments in our facilities and in our professional caregivers. Uh, we've done all of this to ensure that high quality care stays local. Uh, I was very involved in the discussions back in 2015 um, about value-based reimbursement, VBR. When that legislation passed, it was good for Minnesota nursing homes, but I assure you it was not set up to handle a pandemic and it's not nimble enough to respond to the economic pressures that we face today with rising costs of goods and wage inflation. So as we've heard and will continue to hear, Pioneer Care is not alone, but I take no comfort in the company of my many peers across Minnesota who are facing very difficult choices that impact access to care in our communities. The Senate HHS bill cannot wait uh, until next year. Thank you for hearing me today, and I believe last to speak for long-term care is Carrie Thurlow. Thank you, Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Carrie Thurlow. I'm the president and CEO of Leading Age Minnesota here on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. On a personal note, I'm really happy to be here in person. Um, these are important issues. I think this is my first time back, and I'll have to say it's been a couple of years since I've had to sprint across the Capitol complex in heels, so it's good to know that I still can do that, so thank you. Um, if you take anything away from the experiences of these providers today, I, I would say this, that the promise of senior care is at risk. And we are not over-inflating the situation. Um, we are not over-exaggerating for effect. The risk is real. And when we say that at least 11% of nursing homes or 40 nursing homes are at risk of closure this year, if this legislature does nothing, it is real. Minnesota became home to over 1 million seniors this year. Our future includes a future of a growing aging demographic. And I would say that this is a watershed legislative session to determine how we will care for Minnesota seniors. So let me just respond to a few of the um, comments that have been made in the conference committee and try to um, 
try to uh, respond to a few other items, Mr. Chair, that I know you've asked for some math on and asked us to do the numbers on. We've heard in this conference committee that existing laws already take care of nursing homes. And as you've heard from our testifiers, and the fact is that the legislature in passing VBR in 2015, by the way, with bipartisan support, never anticipated a global pandemic. And whether the payment reform we discussed in 2016 would be able to fairly pay long-term care providers um, in delivering quality care for seniors, especially in the wake of the unanticipated situation that we faced over the last two years. It was designed to accommodate expected increases at about two to 3% inflation. Nothing like what we've experienced. It was designed to address stable fixed costs like housekeeping and food and regular steady wage inflation. Nothing like what we expected or have experienced in these last several months. If anything, I think we can agree that the expected and stable would not be words to describe the pandemic or the economic conditions we find ourselves in now. As Nicole stated, over 33% of our providers have increased wages by over 10% over the past two years. And a more than a quarter of facilities are spending over 50% per hour more than they were pre-pandemic for temporary staff last year. And still the workforce crisis persists. Minnesota's VBR system in its current form with recognition of costs more than two years after they occur is simply not nimble enough to address what it takes to care for Minnesota seniors in this environment. And without action this year, specifically in addressing rate increases, more nursing homes will be at risk. I've also heard that Minnesota nursing homes were taken care of because of the 2022 interim payment adjustments that were provided in January um, and the, uh, due to the VBR system. And I need to point out first that the interim rate adjustments provided earlier this year um, were provided um, after we pushed for it. DHS was already behind in, in providing those rates, and those were based on September 2020 cost reports. So the vast majority of those costs that those rates covered were pre-pandemic. Um, Yes, it is true that nursing homes will also receive rate increases under VBR in 2023 and 2024 after a 27 month delay in costs after they incurred those costs. This isn't sustainable as you've heard from these providers. And so again, we are happy to continue to engage in this, this conversation. We are grateful for some of the emergency supports that have been provided to our sector throughout the pandemic but we need permanent sustainable relief or we will be facing collapse of the senior care sector in a matter of months. Uh, we cannot wait until next legislative session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, really compelling. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes and maybe we can just defer to the House since uh, Representative Pinto in particular and others that there that may want to have a question and then if there's time left, then we'll switch to the Senate. Uh, Representative Pinto, did you want to ask any Questions about this? Sure, uh, I, I certainly can. I mean, maybe more. I mean, I'll, I'll just really thank um, the testifiers for what they've shared. Um, it's um, I had said in some comments yesterday that the work that's done in the area that they're describing and others too, to my mind, is about um, providing for the dignity, letting people live in dignity. And I just can't think of a higher calling than that. And so, really grateful. Um, and I, I guess I, I think um, building on something that Chair Liebling had said yesterday, I, I have not heard anybody from the House um, say that uh, that there's not um, great need in this area. Um, uh, I think uh, what this just reminds me of is the great need in a variety of areas. Um, so I, I had had, a, had that question on Monday about kind of how the math worked, mostly wondering, Mr. Chair, um, about uh, I know some areas of the budget uh, have inflationary increases built in, and I think that's wonderful and would hope that we could do that in, for all the areas that are uh, providing, um, uh, letting people live in dignity. Um, and I'd heard the comment about permanent sustainable relief in this area, and I have to say I could not agree more. Um, this area absolutely um, deserves that, and I hope we can do that in other places where, uh, where we're letting people live in dignity as well uh, across um, this, this critical budget. So I just am really grateful. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing these uh, the testifiers in. I'm so grateful to you all for 
for joining us. And I'll just note this to my mind as an example of a number of areas where um, we just really need to move forward and, and essentially demand as a, all of us um, that, that as the legislature that we prioritize this area of health and human services um, and really dedicate the funding necessary and not pit one area against one another. So, um, but thank you so much to the testifiers for coming in and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sure we'll talk more about the math and how, yeah. you know, comparing different things, but this is really helpful. Thank you. For sure, and uh, Mr. I just want to take a minute on the inflation part. Um, so, like, just for the two gentlemen who are here, or maybe one of them just wants to comment. Um, well, actually, you probably know the details, either one, maybe one of the gentlemen who's just actually living there. But my question is this for whichever one of you wants to take it up, just to kind of build on what our son Pinto was talking about and the idea there's inflation. And so, well, maybe you should be fine. Um, and then, I, so just could one I did not, comment on there, please? Did, didn't, and, and Mr. Chair, just to remember, I, I didn't say you'll be fine. That was not. No, no, I, I didn't. Time, so, yeah. Forgive me. I yeah, just, sorry. That was a horrible misspeak. So. Um, okay, yeah. No, but they have inflation, so. Which is great. Which there you is go. Good, and, you so, need even, and you need even more. There you so, go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was, and yeah. it's great. I will leave it at that. Thank you for. I'm not trying to be pejorative here. So one of the, whichever so, yeah. one of you wants to comment about that. So you? Mr. Chair, if I may, I'll, I'll start um, and then maybe defer to our providers. Um, and thank you, Representative uh, Pinto, for the, the questions and the comments. I, I would acknowledge that the, the nursing home reimbursement system that we passed in, in 2015 um, does acknowledge and, and sort of provide uh, regular rate increases. And just to explain, well, when it's talked about that the VBR system builds in inflation, what we're really saying is that we are recognizing increasing costs as providers report costs on an annual basis, which by the way, are audited cost reports by the state year in and year out for all of the costs. And these gentlemen can speak in much greater detail to that. Um, the way that it works is that 27 months later, they get uh, renewed reimbursement rates through Medicaid, which by the way is also the private pay rate in nursing homes because of, of, of rate equalization. 27 months later, those increased costs are recognized in increased rates. So when we talk about recognizing inflation, I would say, yeah, sort of we do, insofar as we recognize growing costs that are actually incurred. But it doesn't prospectively uh, recognize inflation and certainly doesn't keep up with inflation in terms of real-time inflation like we are exist experiencing right now in this current environment with rapid wage inflation. So I just really want to, um, in terms of the math or at least the calendar, really want to clarify that when we, when we talk about that our system recognizes inflation, I, I would say that it is on an, on an actual cost incurred basis. And maybe I'll defer to either um, e either of our providers to say more about how that plays out. Yeah, just for 30 seconds or so. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Please. Chair, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to respond to this question. So, you know, the way I've always thought about this is VBR is designed for slow and steady incremental rate increases. What we've seen, just, just take our food bill alone. You know, our food vendor, vendor has come to us and they said, okay, we've seen a 10% increase in costs over the last year, expect another 10%. Um, wages, that's 65, you know, six, about 60 to 65% of our total expenditures as an organization. Our local, we've seen local wage inflation of 15%. It's documented in the Fergus Falls Daily Journal. Um, manufacturers, fast food, retail, they, they've, they've announced quite large wage increases. So, you know, VBR just, isn't, doesn't allow us through slow incremental yeah. changes to account for these larger, you know, adjustments that need to be made given the situation we find ourselves That's in. That's helpful. Uh, Representative Liebling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just really wanted to um, kind of uh, emphasize what Representative Pinto was talking about. And just to say that Nobody, I think, who's paying attention can fail to recognize the problem. And we in the House share an enormous commitment to making sure that every person in this state can live in dignity and live their best life and get what they need to be at that level, living their best life. And the challenge we have, of course, is a fiscal challenge. 
we do have a very large budget surplus right now that we could allocate. Of course, we do have to pay attention to what happens going forward. But we are, as, as the testifiers have described, and I also really do appreciate their testimony today, as they've described, we all know we are facing a, a very challenging situation. But the problem that we have is that we have many, many needs across the state. I have to tell you that every DFLer I've talked to wants to meet them. We absolutely want to meet them. And it is challenging because we have the money, but I would really like to see the Senate um, at least match us in wanting to put forward the resources to meet all of those needs. And because, you know, a person's need is a person's need. And um, if it's you or your loved one or the organization that you are trying to keep afloat, it is the critical need. But that, unfortunately, is a situation for many people across our state, across our country, I'm sure. But the real challenge we have is how to work together to make sure that we have the resources to be able to meet all of these needs in a fair way, given the limitations that we always will have. But honestly, I think that the, the, uh, the problem that we're facing is that we really don't have the resources right now on the table to meet all of the very important, serious needs that, that we do have. And the Senate tax bill, it is a little ironic that the Senate is voting on the tax bill today because the tax bill, from my understanding of it, is a billion dollars in tax cuts every year for people earning more than $125,000. For $240.5 million every year for those earning more than a quarter million dollars. So there is a prioritization there. And um, those resources are being taken off the table, meeting some of these very important needs and others that are being taken off the table in the tax bill. So, you know, I think we just need the context here. And I, um, before I finish, I just did want to, one specific question I had, um, I know that N Nicole Matson had mentioned some very specific numbers and I don't know if Ms. Matson, if you've already sent those to us in a letter, but if you haven't, I just would ask you to, forward them in writing because I'd really like to be able to have those specifics. I was taking notes as everyone was speaking yeah. but wasn't able to capture all of it. So, so thank Ms. you Matson, again yeah, for your testimony. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Ms. Matson, is, is, is there something of that that's public you could give us to? And Mr. Chair and Representative Lee, we'll make sure that you get those numbers in writing. Yeah. Yeah, send that to Mr. Yates and he'll get it out. Actually, he can, if it's okay to publish, that we'll put that on our one of these sites. Um, Mr. Chair. Just one more. Uh, Representative Schultz, did you want to say anything? Otherwise, I'll go to Senator Benson. Did Not you want yet. To? Go ahead. Not yet? Okay. Senator Benson. And then we're going to move on to this next and topic. Thank you, Mr. Ahead. Chair. And as we're getting that data, and, and I see the 11% closure number, I'd like some order of magnitude on beds um, in the state. And <clears> then I know vacancy rates that are related to staffing versus vacancy rates that are related to utilization um, would be helpful. Uh, and then I'm gonna do some homework on the language. So there is, there's a path here, I just wanna understand how much of the need, if we're gonna do math, then, then let's do, um, you know, we're going through a time of hopefully uh, constructive change going forward and not, uh, a collapse or, or destruction. So those numbers, I think, Thank would you. help with perspective. Yeah, I, it, it's certainly, yeah, the, in the math, I, it's compelling. And th thank you for asking for that. The more information we have, the better. Um, other members? Uh, and Senator Abler, oh, I, would Representative like Schultz. Know, I would like to know from the industry the impact of immigration reform on their labor shortage. The impact of immigration reform on their shortage, okay. Um, is that the jurisdiction of this committee? Yeah. Is that anything to do with it? <laughs> no, I appreciate the question. Um, and, that and, be, and that's work, more of a and, national and question, visas, I think. And work visas as well. Uh, Representative Schultz, I think that's more of a question for Congress, isn't it? That was just, anyway. Um, did, do you want to, <laughs> that's friendly. I was just trying to have fun here. Um, so does anybody want to, Ms. Thurlow or Ms. Matson, do you just want to do a short thing? Well, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Chair, Representative Schultz, um, Thank you for the question. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's an easy short answer. Um, but what I would say is that um, to Senator Abler's point, 
Um, I think that, you know, for, for purposes of these discussions, we really are focusing on our most immediate needs, which are to increase wages. We know that overall we have near poverty wages on many of our positions and we need to elevate those as a kind of a threshold question. We frequently talk about immigration reform at the federal level because we know we need to grow the, the available pool of, of, of workers. So we know that there are both short-term and long-term needs here. Um, so I'm happy to take that conversation with sure. Representative Schultz um, offline in a further detail and my colleague Ms. Matson may have additional comments. Yeah, I just, you know, Mr. Just Chair, briefly, yeah, we, Representative we're not Schultz, fix that certainly thing. our workforce is comprised of several immigrants, but immigrants need to have a livable wage. They deserve to be paid commensurate with their value as well. So, and that's really what we're trying to recognize is that we need to increase wages. Right, I got it. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, it's interesting to hear the, the conversation about the, this is the, you know, this year we've seen one million, one million people that are aging, 65 and older, right? It's the first time in the history of Minnesota that you have more people that are 65 and older than doing K-12 education. I mean, it's your perspective of what we knew was coming to this point. And, and what's scary in this conversation is you have 11% at risk of closure. And the last time I looked, when you look at a medical assistance plan, an MA plan, when somebody does it for a state, one state's medical assistance plan is the same, you know, it, it's yeah. a state, state by state thing, right? When you've seen one, you've seen one, right? That's still funny. Go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah. it's still funny. After all these years, I still see it. But most of the stuff in a medical assistance plan that a state puts in place are, are options, right? Your waiver, your waivers are options, your options for this, but there's a mandated piece of medical assistance plan, and that's nursing home care. This is here. And so all of a sudden now you're saying there's a potential for an 11% risk of closure in the next year. The system, we, we, we've got to stop that. I think that's the, the thing that kind of is scary when you think about it, right, Senator Abel? I mean, this is really, the focus here is not about the tax bill or the focus on something else or education, but the focus here is on the fact that here's a mandated non-option you know, option service for a state to do, and it's going to fail. Yeah. That's not OK, right? Thank that's you. the point. Um, so I will be discussing this more, I'm, I'm sure, um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time debating the tax bill. Uh, Representative Liebling, it's, we won't solve it with that either, but um, I didn't realize how bad it was. Um, it's, it seems like every, we've been having hearings since September, and every hearing it seems like it's getting worse. And I don't, I think this is frankly the worst report that we've heard since September, and it was it was problematic a year ago and two years ago. It was challenging, and but you know you were kind of there, we were muddling through. But I don't know how long you can spend a million dollars a year, or how long you can experience a, a ten percent, uh, you know, loss and think you're going to be open. And I don't know where these people are going to go. So anyway, um, I'm just trying to talk about numbers today. So we're going to do that. Thank you very much, um, and let's move with the DWRS crew. Um, and I think that was, thank you, and I just want to, th while well, we're changing, thank you to the two gentlemen and the, and the people that you represent across the state. How many workers are there, like 40,000 or something people working in the industry that get out of bed every day and go help our people? So it's, it's 150,000. 100, oh, okay, 150,000. Oh, that's a lot. Um, thank you, 150,000 people. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, Ms. Norin and Ken Bance and Cindy Ostrowski. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, we're changing gears uh, to services that are um, really important. Uh, and again, uh, Representative Pinto, I appreciate you provoking the question. And um, in a, this is a constructive discussion, I think, based upon that. And, I am really amazed every time I listen to one of these things, I learn something. It's just it's so deep and so complicated. Uh, I don't know who's going to lead the discussion. And I know one of you are online as well, um, Ms. Ostrowski. But Ms. Norton, are you heading this off? or Ms. Ostrowski is first. OK, Ms. Ostrowski, uh, welcome to the committee. And you're virtual. Nice okay. to see you. And so Hello. we're going to do like 15 minutes of a presentation or whatever, and then we'll talk about it. So thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and thank you so much for your service to the people of Minnesota, and thank you for your time here today. 
My name is Cindy Ostrowski. I'm the CEO for Hiawatha Homes in Rochester, Minnesota. Hiawatha Homes is a nonprofit home and community-based service provider supporting people with disabilities in our community for 45 and a half years. We provide residential support services and family support services. I am here today to ask you for your support and your commitment to people with disabilities and their direct support professionals. By investing in DSP wages, you would be assisting us with retaining our state's most valuable resource, our DSP. Our industry wages for DSPs have not kept up with inflation. Therefore, with an extremely competitive job market, DSPs leave their positions with us for higher paying positions. During the past 33 years that I have been working in the disability services community, I have never witnessed this level of a DSP workforce crisis. This crisis is very real. It is drastically affecting the lives of people we support and our team members. It is affecting how we provide services, the quality of our services, and how many people with disabilities that providers are able to support throughout the entire state of Minnesota. At just Hiawatha Homes alone, in 2014, we used to employ 400 team members, of whom 341 were direct support professionals. Today, sadly, we only employ 236 employees of whom 171 are direct support professionals. This is nearly 50% fewer DSPs to provide services to people with disabilities at Hiawatha Homes. In 2014, we supported 97 people and 22 residential homes and 30 to 35 people and families through our family support services and respite care program. In the last four years, we have closed three residential homes. Two homes were closed in the past two years. Fortunately, we were able to move these individuals to other Hiawatha homes. Today, we are supporting 22 fewer people in residential homes than we did eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And today, we are only able to support five people in our family support services program versus 30 people and our respite home remains closed since March of 2020. Families are in great need of services today. However, we just do not have the staff to support them. Each and every year, like many other providers, we work diligently to both recruit and retain our talented and valuable team members. However, in 2020, we hired 154 new team members yet 172 left Hiawatha Homes. In 2021, we spent double our recruitment budget. We hired 191 team members, however, 180 team members left. We currently are in need of hiring 40 full-time team members. In July of 2021, Knowing that some help was on its way in January, Hiawatha Homes increased our starting DSP base wage to $15.10 per hour. Please keep in mind that this is our starting pay, and so team members with more years of experience um, earned more than that. Our DSP floats, who are trained to work in over 10 houses across our agencies, and our DSP team leaders, who take on more responsibilities, their starting wage was $16.60 an hour. In 2021, the Department of Human Services reimbursed providers such as Hiawatha Homes $14.17 an hour for a direct support professional hourly wage rate. However, in 2021, with paying our team members overtime, differential pays for the weekends, Hiawatha Homes actually paid an average of $16.87 per hour. Starting in January of 2022, DHS has been rolling out a new DSP wage rate to the providers of $16.33 an hour. 
However, this is still enough, enough to cover our actual cost of $16.87 an hour and to pay team members a livable wage. Now in May of 2022, with the rising cost of groceries and gas, rent, and childcare, our data shows us that $15.10 is not working to retain or to recruit team members like we had hoped. Area businesses around us are starting um, team members for $16 to $20 per hour. Our data here at Hiawatha Homes shows that even with increasing our wages last year, from January 1st to April 30th, we hired 46 new direct support professionals. However, 52 DSPs have left Hiawatha Homes. We must value our DSP team members and we must work to save the services to people with disabilities in Minnesota. Although Hiawatha Homes and many other providers in our area and across the state are operating in a current budget deficit, we have to make really tough decisions about what to do. Hiawatha Homes has decided that in May, in May 29th, we will be moving our DSP starting wages to $17 an hour and our DSP floats and our DSP team leaders to $18.50 an hour. We are doing this with a budget deficit and we are currently working diligently to find several other sources of revenue. We're working on grants, we're fundraising, we're using reserves, we're asking our foundation for help. But these are just temporary funding sources that will get us through the year. Without our direct support professionals, we cannot provide supports to people with disabilities and to those who are most vulnerable in the state of Minnesota. DSPs have been working long and strenuous hours to assure those we support are well cared for. Please, please hear us and please join us in sending an important message and a well-deserved message to all direct support professionals that they are valued and they are appreciated for their dedication and hard work by investing in a wage increase for our DSPs. And please, please help us preserve the services to people with disabilities across our great state of Minnesota. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Ms. Ostrowski. And who's next? Okay, Mr. That'd be me. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Ken Bentz, and I'm the Director of Research, Analysis, and Policy for ARM. For those who may not be familiar, ARM is a trade association that's statewide of over 200 provider organizations, businesses, and advocates dedicated to leading the advancement of home and community-based services to support people with disabilities. And I'd like to just note that we did have a um, comment letter in the documents for yesterday's committee meeting. So I get to be the one that goes through the nuts and bolts of the Disability Waiver Rate System, or DWRS as it's called, explain what it is and how it works. The DWRS is a mathematical formula-based tool for determining reimbursement rates for providers who support people with disabilities on the Medicaid waivers. It's constructed from a series of what's called component values, and there are about 11 of them, for residential providers that are responsible for supporting people 24 hours a day, seven days a week in facilities that they manage, typically group homes. The wage component makes up about 75% of the total rate on average. Now it's important to note that the DWRS does not set the wages that a provider must pay their direct support staff. And that was demonstrated by what Ms. Ostrowski testified. And it does, but it does establish a wage value based on standard occupation classification codes published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Because there is no code specifically for direct support workers, Minnesota in statute created a formula that constructs a wage by taking proportions of wages from related occupations, such as home health aid, nursing assistant, psychiatric technician, and human services aid. It's important to remember that legislative action is needed to increase any of the rates in the DWRS. Now, economists and researchers like me might understand how the DWRS works in theory and how the rates are constructed, the mechanics of it, if you will. But the prov providers like Hiawatha Homes, who you just heard from, or RISE, who you will hear from in a minute, 
live or die by the rates that are determined by it, and they're not doing very well. They're on life support, you might say. As Ms. Ostrowski pointed out, whatever was done in prior years is not really the point. Providers are struggling, and in some cases, teetering on the brink today because they cannot retain or hire enough staff to support those who depend on their services. <clears throat> and some residential providers have been leaving beds unfilled or even closing settings, as the Health and Human Services committees in both the House and Senate heard in testimony earlier this session. Providers are further stressed because we are now getting reports that requests for help from the emergency staffing pool that was recently reinstated are being denied because of lack of temporary staff due to high demand. To add some context, because these numbers are pictures, as Senator Abler said yesterday, DHS licensing data showed that 74 residential setting licenses were closed in the fourth quarter of last year. And that's not just beds, that's entire setting licenses. And with a net loss of 32 homes in the fourth quarter of last year. That was by far the highest number of closed licenses in a single quarter in many years, and the first time there was a net loss in, of homes. That was followed by 58 closures and a net loss of 28 homes in the first quarter of this year. This industry needs your help desperately. I have one more paragraph to go. So why does the Senate, what does the Senate proposal do that helps these providers and that those that they support? There are three things that the Senate proposal does. First, it changes how wages are updated in the DWRS by moving the timing of scheduled increases up from currently, they are set at November 1st of 2024 and July 1st of 2026, <coughs> using data that is three years old at that those times. It moves those up to January 1st of 2023 and January 1st of 2024 and uses the most of recently available data at those times. Second, it changes the component values that are subject to inflationary adjustments in the same way. It moves the timing up closer and it makes the data more current. And third, it fully supports the competitive workforce factor on January 1st, 2024. The way the competitive, competitive workforce is currently, it makes up the difference between direct support wages and, and similar occupation wages by less than half. So all of these changes will provide sustainable investments to help providers retain and recruit the workers that people with disabilities rely on for their day-to-day -day quality of life by supporting competitive wages. I thank you for your time, and I ask that you next hear from Lynn Noren. Thanks for the math. Uh, Ms. Noren, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lynn Noren, and I'm the president of RISE, an organization that supports people who have disability and employment and day services. I'm also the government affairs chair for MORE, which is a statewide association of over 100 organizations that provide employment and day services throughout Minnesota. Thank you so much for the brief opportunity to speak before you today. Legislators are being asked to address many critical needs this session, and the current crisis our state is facing in the lack of access for individuals to waiver-funded disability services is definitely one of them. I want to provide just a few important historical considerations regarding the reimbursement for waiver-funded services for people with disabilities in Minnesota. First, one thing to note that it is a unique characteristic of our service sector compared with other services that are funded by the state that almost 100% of our organization's revenue comes from the state and local government programs. Mm -hmm. The legislature sets the amount that we're paid, which determines the resources we have available to pay staff and other program expenses. We cannot compensate for low legislatively set reimbursement rates by shifting costs for people who are private pay or other funding sources. Second, in 2013, all waiver-funded disability services trans transitioned to an entirely new rate system called the Disability Waiver Rate System. Usually we refer to that as DWRS, fondly, I'm sure, right? As a longtime provider of waiver-funded disability services, I was actively involved in the development, negotiation, and implementation of DWRS. Before DWRS, service reimbursement rates were set at the local level. And then the federal government required that Minnesota implement a statewide rate setting methodology to eliminate the variation in rates throughout the state. 
When the DWRS system was enacted, it was done in a manner that was budget neutral. This resulted in some providers seeing large rate reductions in service reimbursement rates and others seeing rate increases just from the implementation of DWRS. And in the half decade preceding the passage of DWRS, we saw flat funding in all of those years and in two of them, we actually had rate cuts. So the budget neutral DWRS system was enacted on a system that was already underfunded. Third, when DWRS was implemented, a financial rate mechanism called banding was used to mitigate large reimbursement rate swings upwards or downwards. With the implementation and eventual phasing out of banding, it became understandably confusing to follow the impacts of waiver funded disability service rate changes as it involved the financial impacts on hypothetical DWRS rates, as well as rates that were held flat through banding. First, during the beginning of banding, rate increases of 7% were enacted. Later, when the first inflationary adjustment was to be applied, an additional 8.5% increase was projected for the reimbursement rates on average. However, between the state and federal governments, it was determined that only 1.5% of that 8.5% increase could be applied. Much of these increases were withheld until banding expired. At that time, it could be argued that providers saw an 8.5% rate increase in addition to the 7% for a total of 15.5%. However, again, the inflationary adjustment was eventually reduced by 7%. So using the 15 and a half or 14% number is misleading as the increase included the 7% from 2013 and 2014, which was the same increase other providers received and did not include the 7% reduction and did not take into account the rate variations that were caused by the implementation of DWRS. And yes, that is really confusing to follow, I know. We have some members of Moore who've been hearing from their legislative context about a 27% rate increase in our sector since 2020. We looked at data from 2010 until now, and our data shows that the rate increases that were provided average 1.2% over that entire time. And that includes the 7% that was taken away. So. Um, Fourth, DWRS does include automatic rate adjustments that are built in the formula, and a rate adjustment is currently being implemented on a rolling basis throughout 2022. These automatic rate adjustments are appreciated, and things would be much worse without them. However, the data used to inform the rate adjustments is based on data published in the spring of 2019, which uses 2018 data. So the adjustments being applied this year reflect a reality of 2018. As we are all painfully aware and have heard today, the wage-related pressures and challenges of 2022 are a lot different than 2018. Last and most importantly, regardless of the details behind exactly what rate increases were implemented when, the fact of the matter is that current state set rate reimbursement for these services do not provide for wages and benefits and benefits that allow us to hire the staff we need to support people with disabilities to live full and meaningful lives. For example, the current DWRS wage rate for the reimbursements that are set um, for, for RISE, uh, the base wage rate in the formula is the entry level weight we currently use to hire people with limited, service, limited experience in our service sector. Because it uses dated wage information, DWRS does not reflect our average wages or what it takes to attract and retain high quality staff to support our community members. Even after increasing our entry wage weight 25% since 2019, we struggle to get applicants and have 70 roles open to fill this year to serve the over 200 people that are waiting to return to services. And that's just at rise. The Senate HHS proposal helps address our current crisis through adjustments to the DWRS system that would be made based on more up-to-date market data rather than over 30-month-old data that's used today. It also acknowledges the very real difference in the average wages paid to direct support professionals 
compared to those compared to other occupations in Minnesota. Again, we know that legislators are being asked to address many critical needs this session. On that list must be taking action to increase access to waiver-funded disability service for all people with disabilities in Minnesota. It's vital to the well-being of people in our state. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you. Uh, Representative Pinto, will you uh, ask for math? And there you go. Uh, what's thank, up? What do you want to Thank you, say? Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much to the testifiers. Um, and again, in the area where we're um, helping people to live in dignity and, and supporting them. And so thank you so much to all of you. Um, I did have a question for Ms. Um, Ostrowski. I hope I'm saying your name sort of <laughs> maybe vaguely correctly. Um, you had, um, I noticed that in the list of the pressures that, um, that the folks who are doing this work are feeling, uh, my ears perked up um, when I heard you <laughs> use the phrase childcare. Um, I know that that's something that's been a real squeeze. And I believe that you all even had a proposal to support DSPs specifically with child care because it's such a big need. And I just want to see, if, could you just talk about kind of the extent to which that's a, a pressure that workers are feeling, kind of connection between affordable and accessible child care and the, and the work that, that you all are doing? Sure, Ms. Ostrowski, and, you know, briefly for now. Okay. Thank you, um, Representative Pinto. Yes, um, several of our team members have had to make difficult decisions about whether or not they are coming to work for their shifts or whether they need to stay home with their children. So, um, the ARM um, bill that was brought forward for um, relief to child care workers is very important as well um, because this goes hand in hand. You know, if we don't have good child care for our team members, then it's tough for our team members to get to work. So child care is definitely very important to our team members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ms. Ostrowski. I feel like I've heard the same thing. I probably should have brought that up in the first topic of nursing home, so I feel like I've heard the same thing for long-term care, a real squeeze. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and, th and again, thanks to the testifiers so much for, for joining us. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sure, uh, and uh, we'll, again, we'll take questions from the House first. Um, Representative Liebling or Pinto or Gomez or Albright, do you want to have any questions? Well, Mr. Chair, I don't really have so much questions. I thought that, um, again, Representative Pinto, I think is spot on. You know, folks are, uh, I've known Mrs. Strowski for years and I have so appreciated her advocacy. She's a tremendous source of uh, not only advocacy, but information. And she does a tremendous job at Hiawatha Homes. I mean, it is, you know, her work is well respected throughout her whole community. and. Um, Anyway, couldn't say enough great things about her. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't think there's any question that, you know, the other, of course, side of this is that the folks that are doing this important work absolutely deserve to have a living wage and absolutely deserve to take care of their children and not have to worry and all of that thing. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's uh, we are we are just all in a really difficult spot, all of us, and it's a lot of this is that workforce dynamic that we've all talked about so much. How do we make sure that we? I mean, part of this is just driven by the workforce shortages. Period. Employers are fighting over folks to, you know, and that's driving up the wages. Which honestly, I think that's kind of a, a good thing that people are making those better wages, especially because they have higher costs and and on and on. But this is a, indeed a very challenging situation that we're all in. And, um, you know, personally, I don't think it's a time to cut taxes for the, for the wealthy. I think it's a time to dedicate more resources, but across the board, because I think as Representative Pinto is pointing out, you know, if we, we, we'd have to pay a whole lot more if people can't, if their childcare bills are out of sight and they can't make, they have nowhere to bring their kids and you know these things are all linked together so somehow we have to figure this out and make uh make it really possible for people to work and do these jobs that we know that many folks that that do this work as vsps once they once they find out what it is they love it and they want to do it and they love the people they care for and we want to make that possible across the board. So this is the challenge we all face. And thank you, Mrs. Strowski and the others for testifying. Thank you, Representative Liebling. 
Yeah, well, thank you. And maybe uh, just a little comment. The other group mentioned burning through reserves. Um, and it sounds like you're paying more than what you're getting, uh, Ms. Noren or Ms. Ostrowski. Or, uh, do you want to comment, Ms. Noren, just on your experience with how you're making ends meet? Absolutely, um, Chairman Habler and members of the committee. Um, we definitely have run at an operational deficit since the pandemic started at RISE. We're fortunate enough to have in our 50-year history some reserves saved, but you know that's not sustainable. Um, in 2020, we also benefited some, from some federal relief funds, and so we were able to provide quarterly retention bonuses to our team, which made a huge difference in helping us keep people through the pandemic. But um, in order to be sustainable for the future and continue to meet the needs that are out there, um, we're gonna need a way to have our rate methodology match the actual expenses that we have. Right. Thank you. Ms. Ostrowski, just want to do a minute on your reserve thing, just so we can get the same context, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Yes, similar Hiawatha Homes have been providing services for 45 and a half years, and our foundation um, has some reserves and investments. <clears throat> so we have been going to our foundation and asking our foundation for some help and support. And so we will be getting help from our foundation this year. And also we've been writing grants um, for program support. We actually did a DSP, support your DSP um, campaign and um, fundraising through our family members and stakeholders and asking them for support and received tremendous support. Um, our goal was 15,000 and our family members and community members gave $34,000 for that campaign. But running campaigns every year and asking the foundation every year and writing grants every year is not gonna sustain our services long-term, but we are greatly appreciative of um, the help that we are getting from our community and our foundation. And just one last question. Do you know offhand, Ms. Ostrowski, uh, just, if you, just based only on the Medicaid reimbursements of the federal and state, um, what are you running short? Uh, do you know, like, what are you expecting for 2022? Do you have any idea? Uh, um, for 2022, um, without support from um, our foundation, I just asked our CFO this question prior to our meeting. I knew you would ask me, um, Chairman Abler. And um, without support um, from any of those other resources, we'd be running in a, in a $800,000 deficit. Wow. All right. Well, thank Senator you. Senator Abler? Uh, Representative Schultz, is that you? Yep, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I yeah, sure. I just want to acknowledge that um, we have heard a lot of this testimony this session and in previous years, and the House DFL is the party that was responsible for increasing the putting in a competitive workforce factor and reforming the EWRS to make sure we have these inflationary increases. So there's a commitment for that. And, and last year we bumped up, um, we increased the timing for those inflationary increases at a time when every single House Republican voted against that bill last year. So I just want the public to know that the DFL is very committed to addressing the, this crisis that we've just heard about in, in um, group homes. And I think that it's, we're, we're in a difficult position when Republicans in the Senate want to give tax cuts of billions of dollars to wealthy families. And if this is indeed a crisis, then I think we do need to have you prioritize and move your caucus to move those resources into these areas where we're hearing about this crisis of workforce shortage and the need to increase reimbursement rates. Because these, are, these rates, when we increase them, um, are hundreds of millions of dollars in the out years or the tails. And so giving permanent tax cuts to wealthy families in Minnesota um, can be, can put us in this difficult position where we have to um, try to prioritize with the very limited budget. We wanna do all of these reimbursement rate increases to meet the needs of Minnesotans. And to do that, um, we're gonna need a bigger budget target. I am going to leave it at uh, that for the time being, because uh, I want to get through my other testifiers here. I think that discussion may pop up again. Um, but so uh, thank you very much to the DWRS folks um, and the NEMT crew. Are they ready to go? Yeah, come on up, please.
And actually, I only have one of your names. So um, I think there's four of you. And so um, you'll be, and, and there's Repson and Liebling, are you, are you going into the floor at uh, 3.30? All right, so there may be a few minutes we could just tail tra over if we want to have a few questions, but we'll wrap it up soon, right around that time. So if that's all right. Um, so uh, who's, are there three of you? Okay. Um, so who's going to go first? Introduce yourself, and if you can each talk, you know, three, four minutes, that would be a good thing. Okay, so, wonderful. Welcome. Uh, um, thank you for your time. My name is Tarek Menesi. I'm the financial officer for Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, we're a family-owned small business, a non-emergency medical transportation provider. We drive patients to and from their medical appointments. Most of our patients are physically disabled, wheelchair-bound, misrepresented members of our community. Oftentimes, they're minors with mental health issues. Right now, we're turning down approximately 40% of the requested rides in the metro. Um, parents of the patients are calling into our office in tears, asking why we're declining rides. Um, they're expressing concerns of how vital it is for them to get their appointments on time. Um, a lot of them are in wheelchairs, can't order an Uber, can't afford an Uber. Um, we've had patients so frustrated they've asked for our DOT number to file complaints with the Department of Transportation claiming discrimination because we are turning down rides. The reason we're turning down rides is because it's financially not feasible. Um, now we shifted our focus on private pay the non-state funded rides because private pay rates are two to three times more than the state rates. Um, I view the private pay rates as the fair market value. Uh, by not raising the DHS state funded rates, it forced us to change our business model. If the rates are not increased through this conference committee, we will be forced to stop all fee for service going forward, unfortunately. Other providers have expressed the same concerns because we are underwater. Um, I dread going to work dealing with these depressing calls every day. Sometimes I wish our legislators can hop on a call with me to tell a struggling patient that we can't take them to dialysis because we don't have adequate funding. Um, now my second point, just like every other person up here has echoed, is um, hiring um, has been a nightmare um, since the rates have not changed in over a decade. It's been impossible to hire and retain drivers. This forces us to lower the quality of required qualifications and applicants just to fill positions. Um, over time, it has a dangerous impact on our companies because we have inexperienced drivers. Um, also, the majority of our remaining drivers are in minority groups who have immigrated to this country to better their lives. They're working long hours under minimum wage with subpar vehicles and equipment. Um, last year, we had 51 drivers, and we are down to 35 drivers right now. So we've lost over 30% of our workforce, um, number one reason being the wage concerns. Um, now, my final point is to highlight the reality of the inflationary environment that we live in today. So ironically, just today, the CPI, or Consumer Price Index, reported the highest level of inflation in 40 years, 8.3%. Um, inflation has not been this high in my entire lifetime. Um, now, if we look at the last 10 years alone, minimum wage doubled from 750 to 15 per hour, so that's a 100% increase. Um, that is our biggest expense. Um, the price of fuel doubled from $2 to $4, 100% um, increase again. That's our second biggest expense. The price of our insurance on company vehicles doubled from 250 to 500 per month, so 100% increase again. That's our third biggest expense. And then when we look at other DHS services, like childcare, for example, um, the CCAP reimbursement on an infant is 366 per week. 10 years ago, it was 166 per week. So that's a 120% increase in rates for other DHS services. Now, the price of a DHS background on a new driver was $20 last year. It cost us $42 this year, another 100% increase. To add, in, um, to add insult to injury, DHS is also raising their annual licensing renewal fees that they charge to us providers because they know they need to increase their revenues to run their businesses and retain their employees. So DHS acknowledges inflation when it comes to running their business. Yet we, as a state-funded transportation provider, have not seen a rate increase in nearly a decade. I'll repeat that again. Nearly a decade, we have 0% rate increase. Yet everything around us has increased over 100% in that time. Um, does that sound fair to you? We don't have any rate adjustments. 
Um, had it not been for federal PPP funding, we would have closed our doors two years ago, similar to other companies here. Um, we rely on borrowing funds from friends and family to subsidize the business losses. Um, we have about six months of runway before we close our doors. Other providers I've talked to have less than that. So I urge the committee to right the wrongs and pass the non-emergency medical transportation rate increase. Um, lastly, I want to remind you that federal laws require that state Medicaid programs ensure transportation to and from providers. It's a federal requirement to the state. The state has a responsibility here, especially when the federal government matches the state one for one dollars for non-emergency medical transportation rates. All things considered, we shouldn't have to fight this hard to get the resources to do our job. Thank you. That was very compelling. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Thanks. Welcome. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, my name is Jeremy Kramer. I manage Blue and White Taxi, and I've done so for over 10 years. Uh, we we uh, do about 30,000 or so NEMT rides per month. Um, I ask that you forget that I'm here representing a company, but I'm here representing uh, drivers, uh, many of which are from the BIPOC community. Um, our fleet alone consists of 90% uh, of people of color who are trying to support them families, support their families. Many are immigrants who live in multi-generational homes and who have made a living out of transport, transporting your constituents to their very important medical appointments. These drivers are the same drivers who during the unknown of COVID kept driving, risking their own health to help others in need. I remember sitting in our break room, <clears throat> sorry, this is hard sitting in our break room making hand sanitizer in our office um, and building makeshift uh, barriers for our drivers to protect them <clears throat> and the members who are riding with us. Um, during the unrest of George Floyd, um, we did lose a driver uh, during that time, um, but they were, they were out there transporting people who needed to get to grocery stores outside of that unrested area. Um, so many people looked up to us because other transportation had shut down, other um, public transportation. Other drivers were awarded a community hero award, and so all they really got out of that was this piece of paper that said, hey, good job. Um, so I'm hoping that instead of a piece of paper that you can help drivers who have risked so much uh, get the rate increase that they deserve. It's been over a decade. Uh, since they've seen a price increase, and obviously, as all the other concerns, the, pri the price of everything else has uh, gone out of control, you know, trying to find, uh, pay for gas and things around us and new cars. We actually had to close down our office in Duluth uh, area because we couldn't sustain uh, anything up there uh, because of the gas prices. Uh, these drivers are driving constituents, many of which are vulnerable adults and low-income families of serious medical appointments for things like dialysis, cancer treatments, surgery, we drive autistic children, we drive children to school when buses were, sh when the bus shortage was on, uh, drug addiction treatments, and this past year, past couple of years is COVID testing and vaccine clinics. Without their services, many people will suffer and ultimately die. Our drivers ha have had to adjust to market conditions and now NEMT is 85% of what they do, but they won't keep doing it if the rates are not adjusted to increase the cost of living. They will unfortunately have to look elsewhere for work in order to support their families. If these drivers look elsewhere, then how does, our, how does your constituents get to these appointments? This increase is nothing compared to what it should be, but to deny these drivers fair pay for their services is to deny your constituents, drivers and riders alike, accessible transportation of their health appointments. Uh, I did bring along Hassan. He's one of our drivers, one of our longtime drivers. He's dro drove with us for over 20 years. Um, just to, and he did over 3,500 non-emergency medical transportation rides for us, and I just want him to talk about you know what he's going through. Hello, Hassan. Welcome. Tell us your name and uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, thanks, committee uh, members. Um, my name is Hassan Sheikh Yusuf. Uh, I'm working for the Blue and White for over 20 years, and I love to work my job uh, to help the people and with the uh, transportation to go to the doctors. And I worked during the pandemic time, you know, the time was hard to work for that time and a few drivers like me. And I worked that time and this job had helped me, all my family. And until suddenly the prices, the gas so up and especially the gas and 
And I have in my drivers and follow my drivers and are concerned and try to stop the job. And I can't avoid it to get so prices high. And because we'll be making less money, minimum wage. And concern, uh, minimum wage are possible even losing my money. So we are not paid if we not go out uh, to take care of the members. So, and I forget, and uh, they forget the council, their right for the day. So uh, I am ask you for your help, please to pass the bill and help those need important appointments. And uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Shekiuso. I hope I didn't mess up your name too bad. Um, I don't see any hands. Mr. Burdick, is there, who is the, is there somebody on board who's like assistant commissioner in charge of this area that we could ask a couple of questions to? Or who would you suggest that I select? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have uh, Joe Hope from our uh, benefit policy area would be happy to answer questions. Yeah, great. Um, well, Diogo, how nice to see you. I have a question, um, and you can come back later with the answer to it. I, I, I didn't catch the first gentleman's name, but uh, he made an interesting comment, which I, again, I learned something I wasn't aware of. I forgot that this is a mandated service that we must provide. Um, and so, I know, Mr. Reese, you're, you're not the decision maker. You're just the, right now, you're the face of the question. Um, but I'm curious, uh, in a budget that spends over $3.4 billion in the next three years, how is it that um, the governor did not realize that this mandated service is about to collapse? Uh, do you, can you give me an answer to that or just point to me, like they can get back to me or something about that? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, thanks so much for the question. Um, fortunately, I can't speak for the governor's office as to what he decided to put in his budget. Um, we have been working with the uh, NUT community this session, as you know, for some conversations we've had um, and provided some significant technical assistance on the language that's in your bill, as well as in the House bill yeah. related to the fuel adjuster. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I, I, um, so I, you know me for pretty well. I don't know everything and I keep learning, but I, um, <laughs> this is a, Senator Hoffman, this is a mandated service. Does that, I mean, does that mean we have to do it, or if we don't do it, it's fine? You know, it's be, it would be, Mr. Chair, inconsistent with my current understanding of federal law. So I guess that would be interpreted by somebody that would probably agree with you on that. That's the All right. the sad reality is, you know, you look at that and you go, hmm. Um, but what it really speaks to is that if we're seeing the system failing in front of us, Senator Abler, that we've talked about for a couple of years, and I think this is our opportunity to to do something to stop that from failing. And so um, I, I appreciate the stories and it just, you know, we've heard these, you know, over and over, but it really is dawning to us that, you know, there's the most vulnerable population in the state of Minnesota that doesn't access transportation, doesn't have a car, doesn't do it. Who comes to the, to the services, the non-emergency medical transportation providers? Oh, by the way, it's mandated because if they're not getting the services they're supposed to be getting, so I guess, Senator Abel, I think that puts us in kind of a little quandary, right? Um, and oh, but these people are rich and they have other rides they could get. Uh, they have nothing but resources. Well, yeah, oh, I, don't no, know. I don't know. 86%. They have, these, these are the folks that don't have a lot of resources. Exactly. Oh, I right. think you're... Mr. Uh, Isaacson, you wanted to offer some. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person today. I'm... Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm in... Uh, oh, you're testifying too, I'm sorry. Yeah. With, uh, some... Flood so just a couple here. minutes, if you can, then we're going to run out. Sure, here. sure. So good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott Isaacson, and I operate Lyft Transportation. We're a non-emergency medical transportation company that was started by my mother back in 1999. We've been serving vulnerable, elderly, and disabled Minnesotans for nearly 23 years. I also represent the R80 Non-Emergency Medical Transportation Association, which is a group of veteran NEMT providers who serve the greater part of rural Minnesota. Thank you for allowing me to share the frightening situation that faces NEMT in Minnesota right now. It's no secret that the cost of everything has skyrocketed as we've been talking about from hourly pay rates to insurance to fuel. 
frankly, the cost to operate an NEMT company have become unbearable. Uh, as uh, Tark had stated, uh, we're at the largest price increases in 40 years, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. We're now paying 350 bucks a month for vehicle insurance, and I'm told that's a pretty good rate. Uh, a year ago, my reports show we were paying $2.60 for a gallon of gas, and now it's $4. Um, when we're consuming about 5,000 gallons a month, that is an additional $7,000 uh, that we have to come up with every month to cover fuel. And frankly, it's evaporating all of our resources. Uh, because we serve rural Minnesota, on average, we're traveling between 50 and 100 miles unloaded for all of the 660 trips that we took in April. Uh, that cost for us was over $5,000, and we're not reimbursed for that. Um, it's become unsustainable. In addition, we've had to give raises to our drivers, not only because it's fair, which it is, but also we need to retain them. Um, we're operating as, as lean as we possibly can, but our budget has been absolutely devastated. So what does this mean? Without a substantial rate increase, we won't be able to take those 660 trips that we took last month. And uh, we won't be alone. 30% of companies like ours in Minnesota have already closed their doors. So what happens if we close? Uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, Senator Abler, we're, we're serving a group of people that can't afford a car. They can't afford fuel, insurance, or maintenance, or anything that comes along with it. And many of them just are unable to drive. This is a, the whole reason that most of them are riding with us in the first place. Right now, a used wheelchair van costs about $50,000. Uh, one in really rough condition you could get for $20,000, but that's still out of reach. Uh, some would say perhaps we can rely on volunteers, but the reality is that volunteers aren't available in all areas of the state, and they generally don't transport wheelchair patients. Uh, and frankly, a lot of them don't like early mornings, adverse weather, or aren't trained in how to transport challenging patients. And probably you just, are, probably can't build a mandated program on volunteers either, I bet, huh? Right, right, right. You're very correct. I'll take 30 seconds. And I don't need to Scott, discourage, discourage them, but uh, it's just not a viable solution. No, I appreciate it. So you want 30 seconds to wrap up? Sure. So uh, basically, we need to do whatever it takes to support any MT funding. And, and the reality is it's going to be paid for one way or another. We're either going to pay for it in transportation costs or we're going to pay a much higher amount for people who have delayed care and deferred care. Yeah. And uh, that's the reality. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, no, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, again, this was more compelling than I expected. Um, any questions from the House? Representative Pinto or Liebling or Schultz or anything. And in, in a second, uh, Tina, I'll ask you just to comment about what tomorrow looks like. But um, any qu comments from the Senate as we kind of wrap this up? Um, so I have a comment, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Representative Liebling. Um, I, uh, I would rather, we have run, I don't know, Representative Liebling and, and Schultz, I have a lot of respect for you. We have run our committee the entire session uh, no one could tell what party we're in, how we run it over here. We haven't talked about tax policy. We haven't talked about politics. We haven't used the term DFL or Republican, I don't think, once in a sentence. We've talked about the people. And that's my commitment as the lead here. And all I'm going to say about the tax discussion is that's a discussion that's actually going on now. It's going to continue between high-ranking people. But in the middle of that discussion, we found a billion dollars to actually shore up this niche of the industry because we thought this was the most compelling, urgent thing. And frankly, after hearing today's discussion, I'm more, ever, more than ever convinced that we have maybe found the most critical need in the state, the most critically urgent need. Nursing homes are collapsing. Services and independence for people with disabilities are running at close to a million dollar deficits a year. We have three individuals, four individuals here who are providing rides to the most vulnerable, most <laughs> You know, every equity thing you want to throw in, they're giving rides to and they're turning them down. So they can't get their dialysis. And I just don't think that's all right. So that's, um, just hope I didn't say anything not affirming to you all, but I just, it's a big deal. And, and we have the responsibility and uh, we're going to continue talking about that. So uh, I want to thank all the testifiers and, uh, you know, and I, <laughs> 
I just want to thank the, the, the history of this room uh, where so many important decisions, many of the decisions that are affecting us now on these very topics were made in this room with our predecessors and actually some of us. So anyway, um, that's all I have. Representative Liebling, do you want to talk about tomorrow, please? Or anything else? Yeah, thank you, Senator. And uh, thank you again for the very interesting discussion. Thank you to the testifiers. And, um, you know, it is, it is a... Uh, um, it is really helpful and interesting to hear about what's happening on the ground. And I guess I would just say again that this is, uh, you know, I appreciate that, you know, when we do hear from the folks who are dealing with these issues, they are very compelling. There is no question about that. And we, we share the desire to solve these issues or help to solve them. Um, it's just that the DFLers in, in the House view this, I think, a little more broadly, that we have that these are only some of the challenges and that a lot of the challenges fit together. But I appreciate that there's a desire to have a partnership at trying to figure them out and solve them because there is no question. We have people in Minnesota with tremendous needs and it is our obligation, whether federally imposed or just from our own moral standards, to, to help people get the care they need to live decent lives and so that when people are working hard, so whether it's supporting others or doing any other kind of work, that their efforts are valued and that they have dignity in their jobs. And that's a really important value to us as well, that they be able to support their families too. So we are all together in wanting those, those things. Um, so tomorrow, just because we, we do have to get going here, but uh, tomorrow, we are continuing to uh, go down the list. We've posted to continue to go down the list of the, um, uh, the sections that we had talked about, talked about the healthcare finance, prescription drugs. Um, we're, we might change that up a little, so please stay tuned because I think we want to um, probably uh, give Chair Schultz an opportunity and maybe the department to talk about some more of the workforce provisions in our bill, because obviously workforce is a big piece of what we're all wrestling with right now, because we have this tremendous shortage of, of workers to fill these incredibly important roles in our state. And uh, for whatever reasons, but part of the reason, of course, we all know is just the demographics of the situation, which are not gonna be solved anytime soon. So we. We have to get our arms around not only the money piece, but also what are we doing to try to make sure that we have folks working, coming into these important fields and to do this really important work. So we're kind of working on getting that presentation together. And so uh, thank you, Senator, and please stay tuned. We'll, we'll post the, the further details as soon as we have them. All right, well, very well. And, and so we'll be, uh... Uh, hybriding in the uh, on the Senate side, so just watch. I don't know if we're, I think we're probably in the presume that we're in room 1100, unless you're here otherwise at one o'clock, and you're welcome to hang around there. And and uh, I don't know to the to the House, uh, you're always welcome to stop in and, and be in person. It's you know the Zoom thing has a point, but just the interactions and the little subtle communications back and forth. It's so hard to do. Well, when Senator, we're... I just I would and I'm say, not. I'm just saying it's just too bad. So you're I, you're invited. I know. We all wish we could. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, since we are the health committee here, I do have to say that it's been, you know, the COVID cases are seem to be really going up, and around the capital in particular, a lot yeah. of people that we all know are getting sick. Yeah. So well, I, I'm not, there's no blaming. I'm just saying it's too no, bad. No, I, I know we all have our different risk tolerance, and um, yeah, you know, I, I, but that is indeed happening, and we want right. everybody to be safe. So I'm just saying it's an open door if they if they choose, be. and people can decide that for themselves. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Representative Liebling and, and Schultz, I'll be reaching out to you shortly. We'll have a, some side conversations. So anyway, Great. we'll look forward to that. Thank thanks. You. Uh, pre thank you for a very good hearing. Thanks. And with that, uh, we're adjourned. Oh, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, you as well. <laughs>